nice to have you here, and, and welcome to those who are listening uh, on the online streaming, uh, which is available out there. And it's good to have you with us as well. Several very interesting questions I want to take a few minutes on, and another one that was just handed to me on the millennium, which we're actually going to be studying in detail here in another night, so I won't take any time on that one. Um, if you open your Bibles to Revelation 1, verse 14... Uh, this is the story of John who wrote the book of Revelation and he turns to see the voice that spake with him. And by the way, what did that voice sound like? A, a, a huge waterfall. It says many waters. And what else? It sounded like a trumpet. And he describes then uh, what turns out to be Jesus uh, who has hair as white as wool or snow eyes flaming like fire, feet like burning brass in a blacksmith's furnace. Um, I once pastored a church in Montana. Everybody in the church were farmers or ranchers except for one blacksmith. <laughs> and it was fun to go to his shop with that big bellows and he could make a piece of iron get so hot and so bright you could not look at it. You, you just couldn't. It would hurt if you kept looking at it. And that's what it was for John. Uh, his, his eyes like unto flaming fire, his feet like burning brass. Uh, he had in his right hand seven stars, and he, uh, let's see, what was one other thing? His voice, we mentioned that. Um, but anyway, the question is, uh, the Bible says no man can see his face, Exodus 33, 20, without dying. So in a sense, even though John saw this in vision, of course, it wasn't in, it was, it was a vision, it was not in person. Of course, it seemed like person. But the question was, uh, why wasn't something said about Jesus' face other than that it was so bright? But I suppose you could say if you actually saw his face, you couldn't live. Then the next question is, will the mark of the beast be actual? I think they meant literal. You've seen pictures of people with 666 stamped on their forehead. No, that's not the case. Uh, it is a mental state or a decision, if you will. And we will look at that a little bit this evening and some more later. Then there's this question about uh, God hardening Pharaoh's heart. It says that many times, or a number of times in the Bible. This is the story where the Israelites are trying to leave Egypt for the exodus. And Pharaoh says, okay, after a plague comes. And then the next day, it says God hardened his heart. Let me ask you a question. And, and so the concern is, was God just being cruel and uh, making Pharaoh that way? Let me ask you a question. Do you think God loved Pharaoh? I believe he did. Do you think God was trying to reach Pharaoh? That's the answer, friends. Sometimes the only way you can reach people is through trial. And you know what, folks? For most of us, that is God's most effective way to get our attention. That makes sense? So it was Pharaoh's choice to harden his heart to God's effort. God doesn't like to go around killing people, folks. And those plagues, in some cases, killed people and made, it, made life miserable beyond description. Um, God was just trying to save Pharaoh. Now, the Bible doesn't answer this question directly, but that's my interpretation of what the Bible speaks of. By the way, uh, more than one person was struggling to hear uh, it's okay with me if the PA people turn it up a bit, but if you can't hear well, um, slip back there, and they will give you a hearing device that will help you. I really want you to hear, so please feel free to slip back there. Who is Melchizedek? I'd like to take a half an hour on this question. I have memorized the whole book of Hebrews, and chapter 7 starts out like this. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem 
priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And it goes on and on. The whole chapter about this person, Mel Melchizedek. The simple answer, which I can hardly stand to say without giving more to it, is that he was a priest. Uh, the strange part about it is, it says there in chapter 7, that he was without father, without mother, without descent. So who is this? Well, he is a type of Christ. Does Christ have a father or a mother or a beginning? No. No, he, he and the Father and the Spirit have existed forever. Now, you and I can't wrap our minds around that. But uh, this priest, at least uh, as Paul wrote the story, uh, and there's only one other place in the whole Bible besides the book of Hebrews, and it's, Melchizedek is mentioned more than just in chapter 7, a couple of other places. The only other place is in Psalms. So we don't have a lot of information but uh, what happened was five kings got together and came in and robbed the people uh, in the plain where uh, uh, Lot was living. That's the plain of Sodom and Gomorrah. They took all of their women, all of, the, all of their belongings, all of their money and gold, including Lot's. And Abraham got together his workers, and with God's miracle, he went up there and conquered the armies of those five kings and took all the plunder and the people back. And on his way, it says, right after what I just quoted to you, that uh, Abraham paid tithe. What does the word tithe mean? A tenth. So a tenth of the plunder he gave to the priest. And the Bible directs that you and I are supposed to do that with our income, to give a tenth of it to, to God. So I'd love to talk more about Melchizedek. I think that's enough. There's a question in here about what my church believes. I'm going to be sharing some of that with you. Uh, I would just like to say uh, we believe what the Bible says. Well, doesn't every church say that? Doesn't all 350 Baptist churches uh, say that? Uh, by the way, I've told you before, I love those Baptist people, right? <laughs> and uh, one thing they get right for sure, and that's baptism. That's their name. And uh, I could tell you stories for a long time about some of those friends. Uh, but we'll keep working on that. Someone says, will we ever meet an ET? I think they meant extraterrestrial. I'm not certain of that. Um, you know, someone outside of this earth of course, the answer is Jesus is coming with all the angels. Hundreds of billions of trillions of angels, probably. And uh, in a few places in the Bible, they're numbered. But it's obvious that the author is just trying to say about the biggest number the author knows. And the number is probably far more than that. Does every sinner receive the same punishment? I would rather say, does every finally unforgiven person receive the same punishment? Is there anybody here that is not a sinner? Don't raise your hand, folks, because if you do, you're not telling the truth and you just became a sinner. <laughs> but every person here can be forgiven. Amen? And I hope you all are this evening, folks. Don't ever doubt God's love and his great desire for you just to say, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. And uh, you understand, folks, you have to mean those words. You don't just say it. But I'll tell you something. You can't even repent, which is a fancy way to say you're sorry, without God's help. So it's interesting how you become willing and God helps you to be sorry. The Bible says God leads us to repentance. Every person in this room, if there's anybody in here who has, been, who has led a derelict life, 
Your whole life, God has been trying to help you become repentant. And if you will just yield, he will bring to your heart a sorrow for what you have done and then cleanse that heart. Is that good news or not? Oh, I love that, folks. I am in need of that, maybe more than all of you. Who knows? Now, about the punishment, there is a verse, if you want to look at it, in Luke 12, 47, where it talks about people receiving stripes. It's talking about the people who are unforgiven and lose their life in hell. And some people get more stripes than others. It says that. So in case that was where your question was going, I don't know just how that works. I know some people, and I think they may be correct, who believe that uh, God will arrange. Did, you, did, did you, somebody asking where it was? Did I get the text right, Luke 12, 47, and so on? Okay. Uh, there are some people who believe that God will allow people to suffer a little longer in the fire. Uh, that may be the case. I believe this text, and this text is clearly saying some will be punished more severely than others. Are you with me on this? The text is clear. I don't know how you could get around what it says there. But God is merciful. And uh, you and I may have questions when we get to heaven, friends. We may have questions. And uh, you will get better answers there than you're getting here from the Savior himself. Now, we spoke about the rapture a little bit, and we're going to speak about it more. Doesn't, um, what about the text, and it was actually in my list there to put on the screen, but I tried to quit on time, and so I didn't put it up there. So turn with me. I want you all to be able to read this with your own eyes to uh, Luke 17. And you know what? Since I forgot my glasses, this will be fun. Uh, but I can usually make it. Uh, you might want to remember I'll try to remember to talk to you about Luke 16. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. It's a parable that some people use to think that uh, when you're in hell or heaven, you can talk to each other. Um, it's amazing to me that, that reasonable Bible teachers actually uh, don't recognize that this is a metaphor. But in any case, immediately following that story, you have... Uh, this interesting passage uh, right near the end of chapter 17. And verse uh, 35 is will it start where it starts. Well, let's, let's start with 34. I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, by the way. In that night, there shall be two men in one bed. This is not talking about homosexuality. It's just talking about two people in their house. Uh, two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, and the other will be left. This passage is where some pastors and teachers uh, try to develop the idea of a rapture where suddenly people disappear. Uh, it's, a, it's a misunderstanding of what's going on here, as so I'll show you. I tell you, one taken and the other left, verse 35. Two women shall be grinding together, and one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, and one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? Now, it's quite obvious to me. Jesus says people are taken, and then the people say where. The, the obvious, obvious issue here is, where were they taken? I don't see a bunch of you nodding your head. Are you with me on this? Isn't that the force of this question? People are taken. Where? Notice his answer. <clears throat> and he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, th is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. This, again, folks, is kind of a metaphor saying, uh, wh by the way, why do eagles gather together? Because some people have died. These people that were taken weren't taken to heaven, folks. They were taken to the end of their lives for eternity. Are you all with me on the idea? So that's a pretty obvious explanation for this interesting text. 
This is why, folks, it's so important on any question to find everything that the Bible says about it. And, and then with God's guidance, and remember, remember the text we read in John 17, verse 7, if any man will do his will, and the sense of that word means if you have decided you want to do God's will, comma, he will know of the doctrine. God makes himself responsible to help you understand truth, folks, if it's your determination to obey it. You will not have his help if you say to yourself, I'm going to see what he wants, and I may not like it. I, I don't want to be cute. Y'all with me on the idea? You might say, that's not fair. Well, uh, I, I'm not in a position to judge God. I think it's a very wise plan. Uh, you can think of earthly situations where this is a good idea. When a young man marries a young woman, do either of them really know each other? My wife has put up with me for 55 years. We're still learning to know each other. I saw a few of spouses look toward their spouses. I'm not sure what that means, but... <laughs> So I think God is doing something here that's very wise. He is helping me make a commitment. In fact, I have stood before many couples, and what do I say to them? I say to them, young man, do you promise? Right? And what does he finally say? I do. That's what God is saying. You give me your promise. And then, in fact, he uses the same, he uses the same metaphor. I am the bride. Uh, and, I mean, he talks about his people as the bride, and he is the, uh, the, the husband man, if you will. So I think that's a, a very excellent plan that God has. Then the last one is, uh, does, doesn't the devil know the Bible? James 2, is it verse 17? The devils believe, and what? tremble. They know what's going to happen, and it, it, they have this twisted, this twisted mind, folks, and this happens to human beings, to take as many people with them as they can. And in this case, I think it's to do as much hurt to God as they can. Do you think God's heart, God's heart breaks? Do you think Jesus' heart breaks for every person who doesn't choose to follow him and spend eternity with him? Of course it does. And I think his ability to have a broken heart is as much greater than mine as he is greater than me. I tell you, folks, I weep every day for my two daughters who have turned away from God. It's hard. I can hardly talk about them without start crying. You know that. You know what I'm talking about. So why the devil has such a twisted mind, it's tragic, but the end of that is soon. And did I already not allude to this? If you ever had, well, let, let, me just, let me just give you a little advance. The mark of the beast is going to be put on people who, who do not wish to follow God completely. And those who don't receive the mark are going to be persecuted by those who do. You following me? And... Uh, I don't want to get too close to this because it's so political, but if you ever had a question as to how the Constitution will not be followed, you should know it now. There doesn't have to be a vote in any legislative body, does there? A mayor, a governor can just say it, and you, quotes, have to do it. You all with me on this? All right. So by God's grace, let us... Uh, Look at this part one of the mark of the 666 creature. Tomorrow night, uh, how to be dead and buried and still be alive. Are the dead really dead? To hell and back. I've been to hell, friends, and that's not a metaphor. And uh, I'll tell you that story. I'm teasing you a bit, but it's actually true. Uh, and God's, God's true rest for his last day people. Uh, the most amazing time prophecy in the Bible 
it's going to be a real challenging mental exercise for you to keep up with this rather extensive topic. What is that, Friday night? And uh, then on Saturday morning, remember Lot's wife. But this evening, the warning against worshiping the beast. Now, in uh, the book of Revelation, in uh, chapter 12, uh, there is a dragon that is introduced, who it says right in that chapter is the devil. There's a really interesting story in that chapter. It starts out saying, and there appeared a wonder in heaven. Behold, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars upon her head. And she being with child cried, traveling in birth and pain to be delivered. This woman represents the church, the true church. It says in Jeremiah 6, verse 2, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. In prophecy, a woman represents a church, and a pure woman represents a pure church. And in chapter 17, believe it or not, there is a harlot riding a dragon. Pretty interesting story. Is a harlot a pure or a unpure woman? So that harlot represents an impure church, that is a church with false doctrine. But this woman in chapter 12 represents God's church. It doesn't represent Mary. There are places where Mary is, is believed to be that woman. Uh, even though Mary births Jesus Christ, in the, in the story of chapter 12, it's like Jesus comes from the, from the true church. Uh, and that's what that woman represents. But then it says, and there appeared an, a, another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and so forth. And then it just says, and that to, oh, that's the old serpent called the devil and Satan. It says that right in the chapter. So uh, we have this uh, dragon mentioned. And uh, in chapter 13, and you can't see, I should have put him up tonight. That, you'll see it on the screen shortly, that creature uh, that we showed you the first evening. The creature that is the beast that's going to have the mark. Are you all with me on this? That's that creature that has a leopard body, uh, ten crowns on his ten horns, and seven heads, and bears feet. There's not a real creature like that. This is a symbol. This is a sign. As you know, uh, the book of Revelation was uh, designed to give us truth using signs. And uh, it says in chapter 13 that this dragon, which is the devil, gives this creature, whose picture I'll show you momentarily, gives him his power and his seat and his authority. And then... There's this warning about us worshiping the beast. And here is what it says will happen to those. There he is. That's the creature I was just talking about that we introduced to you the very first night. And in Revelation 14, this is the warning. We read it last evening, I think. And the third angel followed them saying, there, were, there are three angels that fly through the sky with messages from heaven. If any man worships this beast and his image, and I mentioned last evening, you'll see this, we'll look at this later. In chapter 13, there is a place right before the end of the chapter where an image to the beast is created, and he exercises all the power of this beast. Where did this beast get his power? From the devil. He got his power and his seat and his authority from the devil. And it says that the image to the beast, that's the exact wording in the, in the King James, get, exercises all the power of the first beast, this one what we're looking at. If any man worships this beast and his image, I, mean, I just talked to you briefly about the image, and if they, you know, it's pretty warm in here. Is the air conditioning on? And you, You'll forgive me. I'm an old teacher. 
How many of you have ever been teachers? Can I see your hands? I don't even have to think about it. I know what everybody in the room is doing. Do you teachers know what I'm talking about? And uh, I'm putting some to sleep, and I feel real bad about that, but I'd like to blame it on the warm room. So uh, I, I could put anybody to sleep with my droning voice, right? If you worship the beast or the image, and I'm going to reveal what the, who the Bible says those two things are. They are different things. The beast and the image to the beast are two different things. And if they receive his mark in their forehead or in their hand, the same will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, that means it's full strength, into the cup of his indignation. It's strange wording that we might not use, but this is God's anger against, against the devil and the people that have allied themselves with him. And he, this person, these persons who have uh, allowed themselves to get into this position will be tormented with fire and brimstone. This is awful, folks, in the presence of the angels and even in the presence of Christ himself. Hell fire will be seen by everyone, some in it and some outside of it. So there's that creature that we are not to worship. And you probably have noticed that that creature is made up of parts of the four that uh, were in Daniel's vision. And there's good reason for that that I'll show you. Now, it also is connected with the with this uh, metallic man we saw, because the metallic man represents the same four kingdoms. And uh, what we're going to be looking at tonight is this fourth creature who was so terrible that uh, in his fury that Daniel couldn't even think of an animal that looked like that. He thought of animals that looked like the others, so sometimes people call this the nondescript beast or creature. And he has these ten horns. And the thing we're going to focus on here this evening, uh, and this will be challenge, challenging for some of you. I've, I've lifted this up in prayer all day long throughout the day as I'm thinking about it. I, I, it's going to be a struggle. I think it's going to be fascinating. But uh, this creature stands for Rome, and it, it's helpful in our study this evening to know that the Roman kingdom ruled for about 300 years or so uh, and was overthrown in 476 by the barbarian tribes. Do you always remember that from your history? Uh, by the way, the, bar wait, the, the word barbarian comes from barber uh, in, in, in terms of how they uh, looked with their hair. But in any case, keep that date uh, a little bit in your mind. Daniel goes on to say, this is the chapter where his vision is described, that the, and he's told that the ten horns in this, of this kingdom are ten kings. So this kingdom begets ten others. And the idea is that uh, when Rome is overthrown, ten kingdoms take its place. We'll show you that in a moment. And another, if you will, kingdom shall, arise, shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse or different from the first, and he shall subdue or overcome or overthrow three kingdoms. And uh, the artist has tried to depict this additional or new horn. It's called in some places, a little, some places a little horn. And the artist has pictured the fracturing of these other three to illustrate what is being said here in verse 24. These are the ten kings, or the ten tribes. There's been some question about more or less. Uh, Bible scholars have picked out the ten most likely groups that uh, had the, essentially had the power uh, to become a nation, if you will. The interesting thing is, just for your connection, you mostly would know this. 
these are the names of the kingdoms that we have today that, if you will, flowed from these barbarian tribes by those names. You all familiar with that a little bit? The Vandals and the Ostrogoths and the Heruli were wiped out by this little horn power. Now, um, this is where it gets difficult, friends. Um, Daniel said, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. And that's the little horn. And I'm going to give you the identifying marks that are in uh, that chapter. Uh, let me just tell you up front. Every Protestant reformer, from Martin Luther and John Wesley and John Knox, every single one of these identified this little horn as the Roman Catholic Church. Now, a number of you in this room are members of the Roman Catholic Church. I want you to listen to me very carefully. I love Catholic people. I have over a hundred friends who are or were in the Catholic Church. Neva and I have a Catholic priest friend of ours. Uh, if I gave you his email or his phone number and you called him up and you said, do you know Jim and Neva Brackett? I can tell you exactly what he will say because he said it on television many, many times. He says, oh, yes, they saved my life and I am very grateful. I'd love to tell you more of that story. I want you to understand, folks, that this concern that the Reformers had was not about people in the church. They were concerned about what the church was teaching. And Here's the thing that happened, and I'll show you this in a moment. I'm just going to say it for a moment. There's no question that the Roman Catholic Church, if you will, was the result of the beginning Christian church that Christ sent up and over a large number of years became the Roman Catholic Church. The problem is that along the way, Rome got involved and pagan ideas got into the church. I'll show you some of those in just a moment. And this was the problem with the reformers. They could see this. And you know that most of the reformers started out as what? Priests. Of course, Luther's the most famous because he's the one that sort of was the vanguard of that movement. Uh, and they, it's not that they didn't love the people. They could, st it, it came to them that the church had gotten false pagan religious ideas into its structure. So please understand, folks, this is not about the precious people. Jesus says, other sheep have I fold that are not of... He, 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 he wants and sees people uh, no matter what they are part of. So let me show you how the, how the uh, reformers got to this conclusion. These are the uh, evidences in this chapter, this chapter 7, that come along with Daniel's vision that uh, led the reformers to see that uh, this situation was the case. And I'll just show you here. Uh, there's one more in, a, in addition to that list uh, that I'm going to deal with in just a moment, too, uh, that uh, power would, would be given to this, to this organization, this church, if you will, for a time and times and dividing of time. Now, that the average reader wouldn't have anything any idea what that's talking about. And I'll show you why that turns out to be a period of time of 1,260 years. And for what it's worth, you will see this 1,260-year period throughout the Bible and in Revelation at least a dozen times. This period of time is referred to during which uh, the church had authority. Um, and let me just show you. Uh, among the ten, you see... Another horn that's among the ten. Uh, why do I say after 476? Because that's when Rome fell. And this little horn power became the power uh, in that region. 
uh, it uproots three. I think that's obvious to you from what we've said before. This all comes from Daniel's writing about what he saw in the vision. There's a man at the head. He shall speak great words. Uh, it was diverse or different. Uh, it was a different kind of government. Uh, he uh, speaks great words against the Most High. We call that blasphemy, when you speak against God. Um, he wears out the saints. That is to say, he persecutes them. And uh, he tries to change God's law. And finally, uh, is in power for 1,260 years. Let me just show you um, how that works. This needs much more time than I'm going to give it. But in the Bible, in Bible prophecy, it is very common for the, prof the prophet to speak of a day in this prophetic uh, uh, story which actually represents a year of real time. There's a couple of interesting examples. How many days did the, in the Bible, how many days did the spies from Israel search out the land of Canaan? Forty days. And when ten of them came back with an evil report, And only two said, oh, we can do it. And the whole congregation decided to support the 10 people that came back with this report saying, there's no way we can overcome those giants. What did God make the children of Israel do because they wouldn't trust him to be able to get into that land? He had them camp for 40 years each day of travel for a year of camping. You got it. And you see this throughout the Bible. And it's not just my church that sees this. Scholars all over the place recognize this. I was listening to John uh, MacArthur the other day. I love this man. We don't know each other personally, but I listen to him a lot. I don't agree with every single thing, but he's one of the best pastor Bible scholars in this country. He's just outstanding. And he, he was teaching this just the other day. I listened to it. How in prophetic uh, material, uh, a day stands for a year of real time. Now, the word times is used, and again, I need more time to tell you about all of this. It represents a year, and in the Jewish world, or in the world of the Bible, a year is 360 days. So a time is 360 years, because each day stands for a year of real time. Are you all with me on this? The word times simply means two of them. So that would be 1,200 and, no, let's see, 720. And, uh, and then a half a time would be uh, 180. Uh, and if you add that all up, you get 1,260. So the time and the times and a half a time of prophetic language ends up being a period of 1,260 years. And folks, listen. That's the exact time period that the church had authority until it was finally overthrown by uh, Alexander the Great. His general did the mission. I'm sorry, you're right, dear Napoleon. Thank you for that. So, these, uh, so this little horn, folks, according to all of the um, reformers represented what we might call the medieval church. By the way, the church is not proud of some of these things. Has anybody ever heard of the book called Fox's Book of Martyrs? Um, it's heavy reading. And I'm thankful that the pope, not the present pope, I think it was the one just before him, or maybe it was John, uh, apologized for this. The Catholic Church killed over 50 million people believing that when somebody didn't ascribe to Christianity, it was better that they were killed. It's a very tragic story. Uh, and again, please, please, friends, don't misunderstand this. God loves Catholics and Protestants and all of them, but he's telling the truth about what has happened and what he is going to be predicting. So... 
There's that little horn. Uh, and here's one more step. Not only did all the reformers represent the little, recognize that the little horn represented the medieval church, they also recognized that this creature in Revelation 13, remember Dan, uh, uh, John said, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea that had these seven heads and ten horns and so forth, a body like a leopard, feet like a bear, and so forth. Then he goes on, by the way, to say, and I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. But his deadly wound was healed. Now watch. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who can make war with him? Amazing story, friends. Uh, right there in chapter 13. Which ends up, by the way, it's chapter 13 that ends up saying, here is wisdom. Let him that hath uh, understanding count the number of the creature, the beast. Not that one, but, but the one I had up there. Uh, for his number is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score and six. So these people shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. This is Revelation 10, those who worship this creature. This is pretty serious, friends. If you're a Catholic, this is pretty hard to hear. Is that correct? Pretty hard to hear. But if you are open to a warning, it's pretty good news, wouldn't you say? A loving God gives this urgent warning only because of his immense care. this creature which represents. And why is it made up of these different parts? Because these four countries, or powers, if you will, uh, all somehow became part of the final power that we call uh, this beast of Revelation 13. The beast which I saw was like a leopard. Let's move to the white. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, Revelation 12, 9 identifies the dragon as Satan. I mentioned that. That's the chapter just before now, chapter 12. It calls him, it says the dragon was that old serpent called the devil and Satan. There's no question about who the dragon is in this story. But Satan works through human agencies. So the dragon, Satan, you know this, he works through human agencies. In Revelation 12, the dragon, working through pagan Rome, attempted to destroy Jesus. You remember the story? Uh, the three wise men come to Jerusalem. They see the star. They come, and who do they speak to? They come to the king and say, where's the Messiah? And the, I actually sang this part once in a choir. Uh, Go and search for him diligently. And when you find him, I'm almost going to sing it. Come again unto me, and, and I, will, I will worship him also. That's what it says right there in the Bible, and somebody has set that to music for a... Uh, Easter song. So Satan works through uh, Rome to try to destroy Jesus. And you know this. The first thing uh, that Herod did when the wise men didn't come back, the Bible says that an angel came to them and told them to go back home another way. And when they didn't show up, this is awful, folks. You, you know, you read this and you kind of can pass by it. Can you imagine the nature of an evil heart to just do this with the snap of fingers, killed every baby child, every baby boy in, in uh, Bethlehem, two years or under. Can you imagine the grief in that town? A soldier comes to your home and takes the baby out of your arms and kills him. But Rome did that. Rome was in charge, and Herod was a vassal, as you know, of the Roman Empire. A governor is the one who condemned Jesus to die. Who was that? Pilate. An executioner crucified him. We don't have his name. Uh, it was a Roman emblem that uh, was on the stone, if you will, as a seal. And it was a Roman guard who watched his tomb, 100 soldiers. 
So this is just to show that Rome, represented by this creature, uh, ended up trying to destroy Jesus as well. They worshiped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. You understand what I'm talking about now, folks? Uh, this creature that you see in the top of the screen, that's the beast, and the people are worshiping that beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? I quoted this to you a moment ago. Who can wait more with him? And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. This is in the book of Revelation now, not in Daniel. This is in chapter 13, of course, where this beast is introduced. To blaspheme God's name, to blaspheme his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And all that dwell upon the earth will worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I realize that most of you are aware of this, but in case you're not, the Bible clearly tells the story of there being books in heaven. There is the book of remembrance. And I know this sounds pretty bad, folks. Everything you ever thought or said or did is recorded without error in that book. Yeah. However, the Bible says that you can have that blotted out. Is that good news or not, folks? <laughs> Have it blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come and your sins will be blotted out. Some people want to know what the millennium is for. We're going to study this more. But when I get to heaven, and I plan to be there, and I hope, folks, every one of you are going to be there too. That's my prayer. That's the only reason Neve and I left our little comfortable home and came down here, because we want people to be there. Some of us are going to have people we love that are not there. Is that right? Children, friends, who knows? You suppose it might come into our mind why? Please say yes. And uh, it, it, it's pretty clear that we're going to be able, if we want to, to look in the books. That's, that's, that's going to take place during the millennium. I'll show you that. Not tonight, but I'll show you that. And uh, we will be satisfied, heartbroken though we may be, that God was just. Now here's a little bit of history. A professor of history in the University of Rome says, to the succession of the Caesars, that would be Rome, came the succession of the pontiffs. When Constantine left Rome, Constantine was a general and became the most famous general in the Roman army and actually uh, got it in his mind that it would be nice to be a Christian. He marched his army through the river and said, you're all baptized. And... Uh, This is actually where it started to get these pagan ideas into the church because up until then, baptisms were carefully considered by the apostles and their followers to help people uh, have this walk with Jesus Christ. But uh, Rome fell, and when Rome fell and the... Uh, Barbarian tribes were sort of in charge. It wasn't long before uh, Constantine left, if you will, Rome. He went to Constantinople. And the pontiffs uh, became, if you will, the leaders. Uh, and notice what it says. The transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople, I just mentioned that, was a sad blow to the prestige of Rome. And at the time, one might have predicted her speedy decline, that is, Rome's speedy decline. But the development of the church and the growing authority of the bishop of Rome, or the pope, gave her, that's Rome, a new lease on life and made her again the capital, as it were, the religious capital of the civilized world. 
you can look these things up, of course, in almost any ancient history. And power, and this is what the Bible says in, in Revelation 13, verse 7. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. It's speaking of the creature uh, that looked like a leopard and had lion's mouths and bear's claws. Are you all with me? It's pretty heavy plowing here, I think. But. So there was this universal religious power that came to power and uh, was in power for 1,260 years. The Bible predicted that. Uh, Daniel was given that. So once again, history testifies to the truthfulness of Revelation's prophecies, folks. These things were written down by John before they happened. Are you all with me on this? See? Under him was very nearly made uh, good the papal claim that all earthly sovereigns were merely vassals of the Roman pontiff. I think you're aware of this in, in uh, European uh, civ history, folks, that the pope uh, had unbelievable power over the kings of these various countries. And if you didn't know that from studying history, I was delivered from that because I was a scientist and I, I took all the science courses and I didn't have to, to have a bachelor's degree, they didn't make me take European civilization. All of my friends that were uh, only pastors, even though I did those that, uh, you should hear them complain about European Civ, as they used to call it. Anyway, uh, it was correct. Uh, the Pope had uh, essentially power over this entire uh, European con uh, continent. Almost all the kings and princes of Europe swore fealty to him as their overlord. Rome was once more the mistress of the world. And this is from historical reference, of course. The Bible defines blasphemy as assuming any rights of power that belong to God alone. You understand, folks, that this creature that I should, I should have headed up here all evening instead of just on the screen once in a while uh, represents the church with this power. And it says that the church blasphemed against, blasphemed God and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. That's the exact quote uh, there in chapter 13. Now, this is, uh, again, historical reference. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. This is the kind of thing that becomes blasphemous, uh, as the Bible called it. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Pope Leo the, 20, the, the 13th said that. Pretty brave and actually uh, blasphemous claim. For there is one God. This is what uh, Paul wrote in his letter to t his uh, his young friend, his young pastor friend, Timothy. There's only one God, only one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. God himself, this is a, a quotation now from Catholic literature. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of the priests and either not to pardon or to pardon according as they refuse or give absolution. This is pretty heavy stuff, friends. And those of you that are Catholics, please understand. Um, God loves every one of us. The church got this faulty theology, folks, from paganism. That's the problem. And uh, in the pagan world, men were gods. Uh, you know this. Uh, the emperors of Rome believed that they would never die. As it, you know, it was kind of a foolish thing, but that's, they thought of themselves as God. The sentence, the priest precedes, the sentence of the priest precedes, and then God subscribes to it. Again, this is historical material that you can find. Now, this is back in the Bible. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, but I told you this word, this Greek word, I don't think I told you the word, but it can be translated and or but, and in some cases it would be more meaningful. I saw what it has, as it were, wounded to death, but his deadly wound was healed. And what happened? All the world was amazed. They wondered after this power. Let me show you a little bit of that. Power was given unto him to continue 42 months. You multiply 42 times the Bible uh, rule for the month, for the length of a month, 
What do you get when you multiply 42 times 30? 1260. All through the book of Revelation, over and over this number is referred to. Vigilius ascended the papal chair in 538. Uh, and this is uh, essentially when the rule of the church started under the protection of Belisarius. Again, uh, interesting uh, Christian history. The legally recognized supremacy of the pope began about then when there went into effect a decree of Justinian making the bishop of Rome head over all the churches, the definer of doctrine and the corrector of heretics. A sad part. This is just a drawing that somebody made of, of uh, Napoleon's General Berthier, who came and essentially took the pope prisoner, and the pope died in prison. And this happened in 1798, and so from that 538 to 1798 is the 1260 years that the Bible prophesied the church would have power. He made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established the secular one uh, from Encyclopedia America. And you can find these in other places, of course. He entered on the 10th of February, 1798, and proclaimed a republic. Half Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed, and that with the pope, the papacy was dead. Again, historical references. This is the newspaper in San Francisco. Now, this happened before I was born, but I used to live there. And I, I used to read the San Francisco Chronicle. You can read the date, February 11. 1929, and here is King Victor Emmanuel, Cardinal Gaspari, and uh, the Premier Mussolini agreeing to let the Catholic Church have power back so the deadly wound is healed. Are you all with me on this? Mussolini and Gaspari signed historic Roman pact the Roman question tonight, this is a quote from the paper there, was a thing of the past. and The Vatican was at peace with Italy. In affixing the autographs to the memorable document healing the wound, ooh, that was interesting wording, isn't it? Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. February 11. The papacy has gained world influence, prestige, and prominence. prominence. I'm just going to give you a little quick summary of some of that. Uh, this was a long time ago already, that Reagan and the Pope conspired to overthrow the Soviet Union, particularly starting in uh, Czechoslovakia? No. Uh, help me, dear, where we've stayed a few times. In Poland. Thank you. Uh, so Time magazine on the front cover, a holy alliance between Reagan, a secret one to begin with, and, and the Pope. And so all the world is wondering after the beast, and they worship the dragon, which gave power to the beast. And here's Reagan again with the Pope, uh, the Soviet premier, all these people, presidents, you know them. Um, Bush, and finally, here they are kneeling. This is a little bit astonishing um, that... Uh, I don't know if they're praying to the Pope, but it's an interesting acknowledgement of his, if you will, religious authority. Of course, Obama. He causes all, this is the same creature now that has this mark, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, listen to this, save he that had the mark or the name of the creature, the living creature of the beast, or the number. Now, the number everybody knows about, right? The 666. But you could have uh, the mark or the name or even just the number of the name. I haven't told you yet what the mark is. That's something different. The triple six is the number. Uh, the name uh, is the name of the creature, and there's still the mark that we will study uh, in a night or two. I have to look at the topics to see when it comes up. Now, this is from Revelation 13. Here is wisdom. Let him as understanding count the number of the creature, for it is the number of a man. His number is 600, three score, and six. Now, I'm going to show you something that I don't want you to give too much uh, credit, uh, uh, standing to, and I'll explain why. The number seven in Revelation. I, 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 another one of these, I'll put this on the screen. 
it's amazing how God loves the number seven. There, in Revelation, there are seven churches, seven spirits, seven trumpets, seven, seven last plagues, and a lot of sevens. The number six comes from Babylon's numbering system. Babylon's numbering system. Uh, our numbering system is what we call base 10. Every time you add a number, another zero to the number, how many times larger is the number? Ten times. Their, their, uh, their base was six. It only went one, two, three, four, five, and you could use a zero or a six. So that every time you added a six, it was six times larger. It's a different numbering system. And it sort of represents evil because Rome was so evil. And that's kind of what the Bible is doing with this. So that's the number, 603 score and six. So a triple six rep uh, symbolizes problems, I'll just say. And this is the thing I don't want you to give too much standing to. The Catholic Church vehemently opposes the idea that this name was ever on the tiara. They do agree that that name was given the first pope, which was, he, they believe that the first pope was Peter. Peter would not agree with that. Uh, I have seen documents that, and I don't know, I can't determine the veracity, that say and show a picture of this, of this name on the tiara some years ago. Uh, so be careful that you don't use this unwisely. But if you take the Roman numeral equivalent of these three words, you get 666. Are you all with me on this? This is not the great evidence. The great evidence, folks, is what we've seen so far this evening from the scriptures in terms of the blasphemous uh, issues and how the church started and, and how there was a deadly wound. Uh, and finally, that deadly wound was healed. Why does the creature in Revelation 13 have the features? I mentioned this. Uh, here, you know, here's the lion's head and the, and the leopard's body and the bear's so forth. It's because the, 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 the teachings or the ideas that were in these kingdoms became part of the church. Are you all with me on that? And let me just show you, folks, uh, some of these. And I do this with great care to those of you that are Catholics. But I want you to see, folks, how many teachings in the church actually came influenced by paganism. It's remarkable. Now, a, a good Catholic, an, an informed Catholic, their answer to this will be that we go by tradition rather than the Bible. I remember as a young kid selling those Christian children's books door to door. I met a Catholic lady one day, and she looked to see if the imprimatur was in the book. You know what I'm talking about? If, if, the, if the church had approved it. And uh, we had quite a discussion. And she was very open about the fact that we depend on tradition, not on the Bible. And I hope that's a concern for you, because the problem is the tradition didn't come from the apostles, folks. The apostles, which is what the church feels the tradition came from, the apostles' teaching, folks, is not consistent with what the church teaches. Are you with me on that? And uh, so tradition, uh, the mass, uh, I think you probably know this. The church believes that when the priest takes the cracker and speaks over it, that it actually becomes Christ's body. Did you know that? Most of you are aware of that. And uh, there's nothing in the scripture that teaches that kind of thing. Uh, it's probably fair to call it blasphemous that... Uh, a church or a priest could somehow create Christ's body. Of course, Jesus said, you're supposed to eat my body and drink my blood. And uh, I think most of you would be fairly comfortable to know that that was a metaphor. Although the Jewish people didn't get that, they actually thought that Jesus meant that, or at least they used that as an excuse to, to revile him because the Jews weren't supposed to eat unclean meat. And you may not like this, folks. You and I are animals, and we are unclean animals. Did you know that? Because we don't chew the cud and we don't have hoofs like a cow. So it's against the Bible for you to eat each other. You understand that now? Let's 
sprinkling for baptism, not biblical, friends. Indulgences for tithe. I don't know if you know this. It's not, it, in a way, it's still common today, but back in the day when they were raising money to build that big cathedral that's there, and my, my wife and I have been there. We've walked all through it. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica uh, was raised mostly by, what was his name? Starts with a T. Tetzel, you pay enough money and you can be forgiven for all your sins for the rest of your life. Folks, that's an abomination. That is an utter abomination. And in a certain sense, the confession is like that because the confession says, well, you go do so many Hail Marys or this or that and you can... That's not how the Bible describes forgiveness, is it, friends? The Bible describes forgiveness, and I say this to you, my dear Catholic friends, please understand this. The Bible says all you have to do, and you have to mean this, of course, is say, I'm sorry, Lord, I want to be forgiven. And then Jesus looks at you. Listen to this, folks. We'll study this a little bit later. He looks at you like you never did anything wrong in your life. Is that good news or not? Wow. I don't deserve it. You probably say the same thing, but I'm very grateful. And you know what? When you love each other, you have the same attitude. Isn't that amazing? In the church that Christ formed, he said, love one another, right? And when, and when you love someone, if they did something wrong and asked you to forgive, what do you do? You forgive them. And as far as you're concerned, they never did anything wrong. It's an amazing plan, folks. Um, praying to the saints, folks, it's not biblical. The saints are in their graves. I'll show you this from the Bible. When you die, if we die before Jesus comes, we are in an unconscious state, if you will. The Bible teaches that so clearly and plainly. You, I think you'll... I'll tell you later, because I'm three minutes over time. Uh, confession to a priest. There's only one place to confess, folks, to get your sins forgiven, and that's to Jesus Christ, except, of course, asking for each other's forgiveness. But when I ask you to forgive me because I said something about you I shouldn't have, I'm not done yet. I need to ask God to forgive me for that, too. Is that correct? So just because we forgive each other doesn't mean we are forgiven by God. Um, that's an important issue I think you all understand very clearly. Uh, sinlessness of Mary and praying to her, not biblical. The physical eating of Christ's body, I mentioned that. Purgatory, not biblical. Uh, everlasting torment and hellfire. Am I ever grateful that that's not biblical, friends? And I'm going to deal with that a little later this week, so I'll try not to comment on it now because I need to quit. Idol worship, Sunday sacredness, the infallibility of the Pope. Folks, the list goes on and on and on. I am sorry for those of you that are Catholics. But this church, unfortunately, got polluted by pagan ideas. And it's shown in the Bible as this dangerous situation. So I have worked in countries where every single person is Catholic. Can you imagine me teaching these things to those people? But you know what? Oh, I learned to love Catholics. You know, I'll tell you something about Catholics, folks. They're very serious in general about their religion. I love that. And Neva will tell you, we fell in love with those people. And uh, large numbers of them saw it and left that sad situation and became followers of Jesus Christ according to the Scripture. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you this evening, as we all do, for your forgiveness. Bless every person here tonight, Lord. Bless them. Make us all, Lord, not only pure and clean, but make us workers for you, that we can bless others and lift up Jesus Christ in a time when it is so desperately needed. I thank you in his name. Amen. Amen.